new in this category, so I will try to uh, give an introduction to this topic. Uh, this talk will be quite elementary. Uh, I will start by uh, recollection on the uh, usual Broward degree in classical topology. I heard that you, you are acquainted with uh, classical homotopy theory, and I will try to explain uh, in the second half of the talk how to go uh, to the motivic version of it. Uh, so we start with some recollection. On the usual uh, Brouwer degree, so in fact it's a, a formulation which is a bit stronger than the theory of the Brouwer degree, say that for any uh, integer greater or equal to one, you consider the sphere dimension n inside Rn plus one, and defined by the equation of the sum of the square of the coordinate is one, uh, a set of homotopy classes from Sn to itself is naturally in bijection with the uh, group of integers. So let me be more specific. So if x and y are topological spaces, I will denote pi of x, y, the set of homotopy classes of uh, continuous maps. from x to y. And uh, we'll use also at some point, I need to precise because at the end it will play some role. Uh, when I put a point here, uh, not a star, uh, this would be the uh, set of homotopy, so pointed homotopy classes of pointed maps pointed continuous maps. So here I assume that x has a base point and y as well, which is fixed. And the difference is that the homotopy here, uh, which are continuous map from x cross 0, 1 to y, uh, should preserve the base point. So the homotopy should not move the base point at all. Okay? It's well known. And what is well known, from classical homotopy theory is that, uh, in general, a set of unpointed, if x and y uh, connected, we don't care about the other components with this uh, fact here, uh, is in fact the quotient of the set of pointed homotopy classes of map by a chemical action of the fundamental group of y. Now the fundamental group of Y at the base point here acts naturally over the set of pointed multiple classes of map from any pointed space to, to Y, and the quotient is the set of uh, three pointed, uh, three multiple classes of maps here. So in the case of uh, the sphere here, because N is big enough, in fact, and the fundamental group for N greater or equal to two is trivial, uh, in fact, this is also the set of pointed homotopy classes of maps, which is well known to be uh, the nth homotopy groups of Sn. So this explains why it is a group, and for n equal 1, the pi 1 is non-trivial, but the action is trivial, uh, because it's a simple space. So, so in fact, here, this is also the set of pointed homotopy classes, which is the set, the well-known uh, nth homotopy group of Sn, and this explains why it is a group, and in fact, more precisely, this is a group isomorphism. Um, the reason I will also use this at the end uh, if you take a point space the fact that the nth homotopy group of this point space here so pi n x x null uh, means exactly x zero sorry mean exactly the set of pointed homotopy classes of maps from Sn to the space but pointed why is it a group? I use the following. If you take two elements here, Fg, sorry, uh, you have the natural maps which collapse the hemisphere of the sphere 
Sn to a point, and you take a, you get a wage, and there is a natural projection to the wage of two copies of Sn at the base point. Here, you take the base point here. For instance, you can take a vector of coordinates 1, 0, 0. It maps here, and then you can put F on the first copy and G here, and you have the product here. Okay, and you can check it's a group and so on and so on. So how do you, so the, the theory of the Brewer degree is rather the, the definition of a group homomorphism. Okay, it's a bit more, and you can prove it using, for instance, uh, uh, advanced theory like uh, Ulrich theorem. Uh, you compute first the homology of Sn, and you know that theory tells you that it's an isomorphism. So how can you uh, compute that uh, in a very concrete way? Uh, fact. If you take, it's true for any, uh, if you take x, y, b differentiable manifolds, any uh, continuous map is homotopic to a differentiable map. Okay? So, uh, any phi in the set of homotopy classes of map from Sn to Sn, because it's a differentiable manifold, is uh, represented by a differentiable map F. Now the theorem of Saad, in differential uh, geometry, tells you that if you have a, a differentiable map between differentiable manifold, the set of regular value is dense in the target here. So Saad theorem say that uh, there exists, so it's dense, so in particular it's non-empty, there exists at least a point in the target here which is regular, which means the following. This means that uh, for any y in the inverse image of x, so you take uh, the point x here, you take the inverse image here, you take any point here, the differential, so f is differentiable. These are differential manifold. You can evaluate the differential at each of these points. So the differential of f evaluated at y from the tangent space of the sphere at y to the tangent space of s and at x is an isomorphism. Okay. Uh, this is to be a regular value. It's true, in fact, I didn't mention, uh, I could, in fact, put an m here. Uh, so I could say um, n are integers. So sorry, so this is an n and this is an n. Uh, it's true in general, okay? It's a general fact of, about differential mass between differential manifolds. Uh, so here it means that it's selective to be regular. For instance, it say that uh, in our case here is if uh, m is strictly less than n, it's called a submersion here. Uh, you can deduce from that that the inverse image is empty. Okay. So example, and there is no way that uh, the if m here, so this is a vector space of rank m, can be an epimorphism to a vector space of rank n. Okay. So in particular, if m is strictly less than n, this implies there exists a value, a regular value here, such that the inverse image is empty. There can be no point in the inverse image, which means the following. It means that F maps uh, Sn, Sm, sorry, to Sn minus the point X, and the image is contained here, and this is, of course, homeomorphic to Rn, which is contractible. So this proves that in that case, f is homotopic to the constant map. Okay, so this is a way, a heuristic way to uh, prove, in fact, the, the theorem which I didn't put here, that if m is strictly less than m, the set of homotopic classes here is trivial. Okay, there is nothing. 
Now what happened for m equal n? In general, it's complicated if m is bigger than n, of course. We all know that. Uh, it's not easy to compute. We already saw these kind of things. So now let me concentrate on the case m equal n. I do the same thing, so I take homotopy class, which is represented by a differentiable map from Sn to Sn. I apply Sartre theorem, let x be a regular value. So it says that uh, the inverse image of x is a set as a consequence uh, we see that automatically this set is finite as a consequence of what I'm going to write. A priori, you have to prove it. Uh, so we have finitely many points here in the inverse image such that the differential uh, of the map f at the point yi, so for any y, is an isomorphism from the tangent space to of course, it's an epimorphism, but the dimensions are the same, so it's an isomorphism uh, to the tangent space of Sn at x. Uh, so this proved by the local inversion theorem, the local homomorphism, that these points are isolated. So there are finitely many because Sn is compact. Okay. And uh, so what does it give us? Now, the observation, we already saw this appearing somehow. So Sn is inside Rn plus 1. So this is oriented trivially. And uh, as a consequence, the sphere Sn is tautologically oriented because at any point, uh, you take the center and the zero vector here. At any point of the sphere, you have the line which go out. So the sphere Sn, the normal bundle, is oriented. So automatically, if you have a manifold, inside a bigger manifold which is oriented, the normal bundle is oriented, so the, the sphere itself is oriented. Uh, there is a mechanical way to orient the tangent space at any point. So there is a mechanical orientation. So is oriented. I mean, there is a continuous way to uh, give an orientation on the tangent space at Sn at any point, compatible. Once you know this, uh, this is a isomorphism between two oriented uh, real vector space of dimension n, uh, you get a sign. So the sign, so epsilon uh, of f at y, i, is plus one if this isomorphism preserves the orientation, and minus one if uh, the differential inverse and orientation is a sign, plus or minus one. And, uh, so you have two opportunities. And now you see uh, some quantity appearing, and this is the degree. You take the sum of these signs over all i's. Definition, the sum of the signs, so epsilon F at each i here is called the degree of f at x, x being a regular value. So one of the theorems, so it's an integer, of course, three integer, and the theorem from by Brower is that this is independent. It doesn't depend on x. So this defines the, uh, the, the map from the, so to say, homotopy class of map from Sn to Sn to Z. Okay? And uh, to prove it's an isomorphism, then you have to reinterpret everything and you have to check this is really the computation uh, the using uh, Huevis and so on. Um, let me give some examples. S1 for 
n equal 1. So we take differentiable map from S1 to S1. I can always assume by rotating uh, S1 that takes uh, uh, any point, fixed point, to itself. So pointed. I can always uh, rotate S1. And in fact, you can also observe that this is uh, naturally the one point compactification of, uh, of R and the circle you remove the point which is so called at infinity and uh, when you remove this point here you get exactly a, a manifold which is uh, diffeomorphic to the real numbers so I assume that this takes the point at infinity to the point at infinity uh, here and I want to see concretely how can we compute the degree. So I will, in fact, in my drawing here, assume that infinity itself is a regular value, as you will see, I will explain. So uh, now the restriction of uh, F to R uh, is a differential uh, map from R minus finitely many points to R, okay? And because uh, you, have the, you have to remove the inverse image of infinity. So this is the usual thing that you do when you draw the graph for a differential map. So let me, so I took several here. So uh, where these are the points which are in the inverse image of the infinity here. So they are asymptotes. So this is uh, y1, so I will change. I will call uh, the inverse image of x now the y's, the x to be uh, more compatible, so these are the x's and y, and this is uh, y is f of x. So you remove, so here I draw this this way, uh, x2, uh, oh, just here, okay, so for instance. So it means here, uh, so this point here, 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 exactly the inverse image of infinite. So it's not defined, so the image is infinite. That I do not uh, assume that the point infinite is in the inverse image means that uh, the limit at minus infinity or plus infinity is constant. So it means the graph will start, there is a limit somewhere here at infinity. So now I can draw this way. Now I told you that I assume that infinite is a regular value. What does it mean? It means that when I go to infinity, the differential uh, at the, of the map at infinity uh, is an isomorphism. It means I cannot draw this way. Because if I have this, it would mean a singularity, something like that. And the differential would not be an isomorphism. So I will uh, start from this way here. And again here. Again, so to be very simple, here I did that. Yeah, this, and I told you there is a limit, so you get such a graph here. So now, uh, the degree of f at infinity using my formula here. So how do you do this? So for x1, you have to uh, see whether the differential preserve or reverse. Clearly, and the canonical orientation of the circle go up here, this goes up, so the uh, sign here is plus one. So it's plus one. Here you have also plus one. Here, uh, again, plus one. So here you have uh, plus one and minus one. Sorry, no, here. So what did I do? I'm oh, sorry, so here it's plus, and here you have minus, sorry. So this corresponds to this one. Here, you have uh, three times plus. You have minus one coming from here, and uh, another plus one. So at the end, you get three. Okay. So you can check and it works. Now, I did it the way that zero is also regular. 
So let's check. So zero uh, on my graph here. You have here means plus one. Uh, it's uh, preserving. Plus one, plus one, minus one. So they cancel and uh, cancel. And here plus. So you get exactly three as well. So where are the known regular value? So this is when something like that happens. So you have to avoid this one. Okay. So it's not completely clear how to prove it's independent, but uh, I hope you will be convinced. Uh, a remark. Or rather, a generalization. So now I want to make a special case. So here I assume that f was differential. Now I want to slowly move to the algebraic setting. So we are uh, over the real numbers. Uh, so where is it? Yeah. So what happens if I uh, choose not f to be differentiable, but something stronger, a uh, Russian fraction. So example two, we assume that f is given by a Russian fraction here, over the real numbers. So it means the quotient of two polynomial. Which are uh, co-prime. Uh, you know that polynomial can be factorized in uh, product of uh, irreducible polynomial, and we uh, suppose that there is no common factors, okay? It's uh, irreducible here. Uh, then uh, if, so we also assume that uh, P, so co-prime, so P is non-zero, and uh, because it would be the constant map zero, okay, to be trivial. So we have this uh, rational fraction here. Um, it's easy to check. So these define uh, that f extends. So a priori, uh, you learn in school, uh, these define a map from r minus the zero locus of q to r. But it's easy using the uh, identification to see that it also extends at infinity. So you can extend this. Uh, it's differential. It's a differentiable map, of course. And it extends uh, uniquely by density to a continuous map uh, here, which I would put f index r, because it's the uh, one point compactification of the real, which I would also write as p1 of r. Sorry? How I put r in S1? Huh? It's a one point co compactification, yeah, OK? Yeah. So you extend this uniquely, you check that uh, yeah. if you go close to such a point, you, you will go to infinity because they are co-prime, okay? And I call this P1 of R. So first, from the, the first statement, we have a degree here. Now we observe that in fact, because it's a Russian fraction here, we can also extend this map to a map from the uh, Riemann sphere, S2 to S2. Now we may consider f index c from uh, c minus the zero locus of q. So of course here you can, it's a complex zero locus. So not all the roots of q are uh, in r. So you have to remove maybe finitely many more in c here. So you have this map here and you can see that uh, this S2, which is a one-point compactification of C, or which is also the Riemann sphere, so the complex point of P1 here, also extends uniquely. So you get a degree of the complex uh, morphism here, uh, induced from S2 to S2 by uh, the rational fraction, and you have the degree of the real one. So they are not the same in general. D 
different in general. For instance, even the simplest, so one reason is the following. Uh, if you look at this, uh, the orientation on S2 coming from uh, the complex number uh, is the orientation of C, and because F is a fraction, a rational fraction with the R coefficient, uh, all the points which are regular, the differential would be a complex uh, morphism of complex vector space. So it would be an isomorphism from C to, to C to another, and it's automatically oriented. So all the uh, signs that you will get here are always plus. Yeah. So you have finitely many uh, complex points here. Uh, you take a regular value, but you only get a sum of uh, plus one here. So this would be a natural number. Here, in general, it's a, a rational number. Okay. Uh, the smallest example being uh, you take, I think, minus z. And if you take minus z, so the function minus the identity. Uh, over the real, the, the degree would be minus one, and over the complex is plus one. Okay, but what you observe by doing this here, you have so these are the uh, tilde or prime here. You have many, you have maybe more here, uh, the complex solution, and here these are the regular value uh, in R, plus or minus one. What you see is that uh, the difference here is just a sign for the one which are real. And if the y prime is a complex uh, root, which is not uh, in R, they come two by two because the, the map is real. So if you have a complex, you have also the conjugate, which is not real. So they come two by two. So what you see, in fact, that these numbers are congruent modulo two, always. So the difference is divisible by two. And now uh, such a the data uh, can be reformulated as uh, a well-known object. And surprisingly, this, is, this can be generalized to any field. So what is a, should be a reflex? We are working over the real numbers. And we have a pair. So you have a z. Z modulo 2, Z here, and the reduction modulo 2 here. Uh, we have uh, the degree of the real point here of F, the degree of the complex point here, and the degree here. So it means they lie in the fiber product. And the fiber product, this, the fiber product, uh, is exactly the quotidic bit ring of the real numbers. So here comes uh, quadratic forms, so you can complain. But in fact, if you remember, again, uh, in uh, I don't know, university or sometime also in uh, high school, if I give you a natural number, and uh, you can also, I told you, uh, it's also a, an integer, uh, but in absolute value, it is less or equal to this one. Because I told you here, you have maybe more points. So I give you a natural number and a rational and um, uh, integer in absolute value, which is less to this one, and they are congruent modulo two. It's a quadratic form over R. It's really huh? you have the rank and the signature. Okay, so a natural number and mu or epsilon in Z such that. In absolute value, it is less or equal to lambda, and it's congruent. Module two, it's exactly the same thing as a quadratic form over R. So what I'm going to explain in the second part yeah, of the lecture is that this can be generalized to any commutative field. Um, so I will try to remain uh, elementary, but you will see, uh, you already saw at some point, and you will see the next talks, uh, that this can be really uh, further generalized in a non-elementary uh, way. So now I fix the field. So now
from the little field, which is fixed. Um, so to, if we want to, be, uh, to do something analogous, we should know what is the analog of S1, S2, uh, if we want to stay elementary, or this kind of thing. So uh, if, you want with, uh, to, if you work with uh, uh, smooth algebraic variety over the field K, what you saw in the previous talks or things like that, they are uh, obvious uh, candidates. So the algebraic Riemann sphere, the one dimension of projective space over K, which is, uh, well, really, you take the affine line, and the affine line, really, in terms of uh, elementary algebraic geometry, is just the field K, if it is algebraically closed, with some structure, uh, Zariski topology, and so on, and you compactify. So you add one point. It's really true. A1 over K is an open subset, and the complement is one point, the point at infinity. So this is one uh, obvious candidate, because if you take k to be the real numbers, and you take the real points, you get S1. Okay? And even, and this is a whole story, but if you work over the real numbers, you take this uh, smooth variety and you take complex points, which I can do, you get S2. So it's a, it's a sphere, but it depends, the dimension is unclear. It depends on which field you plug in. Okay? If you evaluate on the real numbers, you get S1. If you evaluate this on the complex, you get uh, the classical topology here is S1, and you take this over the complex number, you get S2. So what we are going to develop is to take care of this, exactly in the same way as we saw uh, this congruence over there. There is also some other example that we met. I will only talk at the very end, just to mention, if time allows. Also, for instance, a2 minus 0, in general, a n minus 0. Um, <coughs> a n minus 0, so, so for instance, a1 minus 0 is GM, the multiplicative group, which we met already in uh, many talks. Uh, yeah? So this is also considered as a sphere, like I, a n minus 0, or a2 minus 0. One intuition is to, again, uh, so you are over a general field, but if you assume the field is R, you evaluate, so the evaluation of that over the real number is R minus zero. But up to a motopy, R minus zero is two points. It is a zero-dimensional sphere, okay? So GM is, over the real, a zero-dimensional sphere. If you evaluate on C, it is C minus a point, it is a circle. So it's uh, the unclear which dimension, but it's uh, correct intuition to say it's a, it's, a, it's a sphere, a kind of a sphere, okay? And you saw that this uh, object were, tends to be inverted when you want to do stable homotopy theory. So we have this kind of example. I will basically use this one, okay, here. And um, So in fact, you can compare this. Maybe you, I will not prove this uh, in general. Uh, so some remark on these spheres. So P1, uh, I told you it's the one point compactification. So it contains a copy of A1, an open subset here. Uh, but in fact, if you remove, so here it's the usual affine line. So you have zero, if you remove zero, you can check that because any point here is are equivalent, that the complement is also an A1, containing uh, the point at infinity. And the intersection of these two open subsets, so it's a covering, and the intersection is exactly A1 minus zero, or this A1 minus uh, the point here, infinity. But you have this diagram here. And the fact is that as a scheme, this is obtained by gluing a copy of A1 and A1 containing GM in a tricky way. You can check 
here this is the canonical uh, inclusion. Here it is uh, the one which takes z to z inverse. Okay. Here, of course, here. Yeah. So, and this is the way you glue this. But uh, from the topological point of view, uh, this implies that p1 is homotopy equivalent in a very naive way. I told you it will just remain elementary. If you believe that there is a homotopy theory where a1 is like an interval, uh, that you have amalgamate sum, uh, like in classical topology, this tells you that p1 is the uh, homotopy co-limit of a diagram with gm here mapping to the point, to the point. So it is a suspension, simply through suspension of gm. So the susp uh, suspension of gm is indeed a sphere, and this is the circle, but the topological circle, there is no weight, nothing uh, weird or funny, and everything is contained in the gm. Okay. So you can check that the a n minus zero are a bit different, so this is why you don't uh, get the same kind of answer when you take a real and complex point. Using this, in fact, this is the, so you have, it's covered by n open affine covering, uh, uh, isomorphic to a n minus one cross gm, and the n intersection each other is gm power n. So it's easy to check that this is the, what is called the join of n copies, so if you know this, of gm, and this is the, the join of two spaces uh, is the suspension of the smash product. So here it's the n minus one suspension of gm smash n here. So again, suspension topological one is a sphere. And uh, again, so basically gm is the basic example. So now I will try to do the same theory. Surprisingly, you can do almost the same thing. I take a, a rational fraction with quotient in K. Again, same assumption. P is non-zero, and P and Q are polynomial which are co-prime. A rational fraction with quotient in K. Uh, in fact, you can check that F induces a morphism, in fact, a dominant morphism from P1 over K to P1 over K. So you can compactify. Again, you can uh, first observe that it defines a morphism in the very naive way from the affine line minus the zero locus of Q, and you evaluate Q is well defined to A1. And these are open subsets here, and it extends uniquely. And it is dominant. In fact, any morphism of this type here has this form except the constant morphisms. And what is constant, but the constant morphisms are uh, obviously homotopically trivial, not interesting. So you look at this. It's a, a dominant morphism, and we try to do the same theory. Uh, what could be done, uh, uh, the analog of Sartre theorem, theorem, so here in characteristic zero is the generic uh, fact, the fact that uh, this morphism is generically etal, or generically uh, smoothness, so here is generic smoothness in character zero, I will not explain. But it says exactly that the set of regular value, I will explain what it means, uh, in the target here is also dense in character zero for a dominant morphism here. Well, also for a non-dominant. Uh, it says that, uh, so, in characteristic zero, there exists a point in the target here, which is regular. So I will uh, give one example of regular, but it's unfortunately not general. 
uh, regular means a bit more. I will explain uh, more complicated. I will explain why, but just to give the uh, intuition. For instance, assume that the inverse image here. So automatically, uh, it's a finite morphy. So we know that by definition that the inverse image of any closed point here is finite because it's dominant here. Uh, you can write finitely many points here. Uh, we assume that point, point in P1, uh, that's the big difference, but like uh, over the real numbers, uh, point here can be rational, can have uh, residue field K, but can be also uh, bigger. The, rational, the residue field can be a finite extension of K, uh, and there are much more than uh, over R, of course. Uh, but we assume first such that the yi's are each rational over k. So it means there are solutions of this uh, equation here. It's very concrete. And p of y uh, equal x of q of uh, y with y an element of k. Uh, so we have finitely many, and we assume that they are all of these rational over k. Uh, so then again, so this uh, scheme, so this variety over k is smooth. It has a tangent space. Uh, if you are in A1, for instance, the tangent space is A1. It's a fine line uh, as a vector space here. Okay? So again, for any i, the differential of f is well defined. And uh, to be regular means that uh, the morphism from the tangent space here to the tangent space where x is an isomorphism. So this is a regular smoothness, or in the case of the same dimension, it's uh, eta. So again, you get this. Uh, in case, I will uh, probably not have time to mention this in very details. Let me check the time. Uh, I have 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so, of course, it's very restrictive here. So, what happens in general? So, here, uh, first, let me make two comments. Over the real, I told you uh, P1 is oriented, also uh, S2. So, an isomorphism of this type uh, gives you a unit and a sign. Uh, so here, the differential uh, at the point y i, so t p one y to an isomorphism t p one x. So here it's not canonically isomorphic to uh, to the uh, to k as a vector space, but what is true, p one is oriented. So it means uh, you don't have a, a canonical basis, a canonical vector, non-zero vector here, which is a basis. But the choice of a such a vector up to squares is canonical. So there is a canonical way to say I take uh, an element here, uh, non-zero. It's a basis. So for any choice of this, I get the affine line uh, as a vector space, a vector uh, group, as uh, Philip mentioned. And here also, and this is a canonical up two squares. So now, once you have this identification, an isomorphism here gives you exactly a unit. An isomorphism from the affine line to the affine line, which is a linear isomorphism, a vector space of rank one, it's an element, uh, it's a unit over k. So what you see, uh, the difference uh, with this strong assumption is that the finite, uh, finitely many element in the inverse image define a unit canonically over k up to square. And so it's canonical up to square. So this element here is canonical up to square. First remark, this is a set of quasi forms of rank 1 over k. Exactly, up to isomorphism. Uh, if you look at that, the definition, symmetric bilinear uh, uh, non different uh, form over k of rank one is exactly this. Okay? Uh, 
second remark, so before I go further, in general, the condition is too uh, important, so it's too, too strong. Uh, F minus one of x is a collection of finitely many points here, but the residue fields of the yi's is only a finite extension, is a finite separable. So it's technical, but I am cutting zero. So every extension is separable. Extension of k. Of course, this theory, if k is algebraically close, there is no, so they are all k rational, and we are back, we get only uh, plus one. Okay, but in general, uh, this gives you much more. And what we can do, the differential calculus and this assumption of being a, a generically uh, a submersion, so in that case, generically etal. Uh, so you cannot define this, but you can get this after extension. So this is a vector space over the residue field of, of y, and you extend this. And now you get an isomorphism. And you can do the same thing, it's oriented up to square. And what you get in this more general, so which is the uh, generic assumption, uh, for any i, you get the class, the differential of f at what i define an element in the unit group of the residue field of y modulo squares. And the squares here come from the fact that uh, p1 is oriented, so you can check it, the tangent bundle of P1 is a line bundle, which is a square, okay, canically. So you choose this, and you have this square everywhere. And this is the, the point. So now definition, the degree of F, so my rational fraction here, at Y, at, uh, sorry, at X, X is the regular value, uh, is, so in the first case, In the first case, which is the case with a strong assumption that all the, uh, the elements are uh, rational, is the sum of the, well, so if you remember, I get here and the differential, this element here is the differential of f at y, give me so the class here, a unit modulo the squares. So I consider this uh, as a unit over k modulo the square. I told you this is exactly an isomorphic class of quasi form of rank one. If I take the sum, there are finitely many, this I consider in the Grotten degree ring of uh, quadratic form of a K. Take this sum, just, it's a, uh, so this is a quadratic form, in fact, it's, effi it's uh, effective, it's not a, a formal inverse, it's the sum, uh, it's a rank, the rank of this form uh, is exactly the number of uh, points here, and it's defined by this uh, unit uh, up to squares. Okay, so it defines you an element here. Uh, in the second case, here, which is more complicated, so uh, the df bar, uh, the differential at y, define a unit, but here, okay, so the sum of i, so you have this element, which is a class of a unit in the residue field of y modulo the squares, it's not over k, but you take the transfer. There is a transfer from the residue field to k. And now this is a quadratic form of rank over k, of rank exactly the degree of the field over k. It's a quadratic form of uh, over k, of rank the degree of kappa of y over uh, k, and it is defined, so you have a unit using the trace form. Uh, if you know uh, field theory, it's a separable extension. You can take the trace form from cap, uh, cap of y, cross cap of y to k, you take the product of two elements and take the trace, the linear trace. It's a bilinear symmetric form, and, and if you plug this to this uh, element here, multiply by this, you get a quadratic form of k. Okay. So this is the more, most general uh, definition here, and the theorem, is that this is independent of the choice of x, and this is a degree. 
call this the motivic degree. In fact, I can even sketch you, well, of course, it will be a bit uh, cheating, but I can uh, show you the proof. Uh, so theorem. So remember, I started with a field, a rational fraction in uh, over this field here, and I choose a regular value, so an assumption that there is a regular value. I mentioned what it means, but it's true in Cartesian zero, there are always regular values, is uh, independent of x. x, and we denote it by by degree of f. And this is an element in the quotient of bit ring of, uh, so what is this? Uh, so we take quadratic forms up to isomorphism over k, so finite dimension, symmetric, non-degenerate, quadratic form, uh, bilinear symmetric form, if you want to include the k of characteristic two. Uh, this is not a group or a ring, it's a semi-ring. Uh, so you can add to quadratic forms, you can multiply, but you have no inverse. So you take the group completion, so you add formally inverse to this. This is called the Grotenig bit ring, but using the standard theorem, you can see, for instance, it's a subset here inside. So this is the Grotenig bit ring here. In fact, uh, the definition defines an element here, okay? But for some reason, we need to extend it in general. So here's the uh, heuristic. So proof. How can I prove this? Uh, just by hands. So I need to extend the world where I'm working, so P1, uh, so I have A1, P1, so smooth schemes, so we saw some uh, notation of spaces and so on, so we have to imagine that we can uh, embed everything in a bigger category where we can take uh, quotient as we want. Uh, we can, uh, if you have a sub open subset in uh, P1, for instance, we can collapse this open subset to a point. So proof of the independence, so I take the morphism F, so this is independent, it only depends on F, of course. Now I take this here. So you take the inverse image and I see finitely many close points in this uh, variety, here, the Riemann sphere over K. So I consider uh, the complement This is the inverse image here, finitely many close point. When I remove this, it's an open subset here. And I told you, we can quotient by this open subset. And uh, the morphism F here, so it doesn't factorize here, but of course, by definition, the inverse image, uh, this open subset is the inverse image of P1 minus X. So the following diagram commutes. This is commuted here. So this morphism uh, composed with this one is equal to this one. Now, here's the, the idea. This as a shift, or as a space, over k is chemically isomorphic, not homotopic, right? it's chemically isomorphic to the wage uh, over each high here of the same thing but with, with one. And these, by the purity, if you remember, we saw this uh, many, many times, it's also uh, equivalent to P1k over kappa of y, the residue field, modulo the complement of the point, but in uh, which is a rational point here. And this is the affine line over the residue field of y. So in the stronger uh, assumption here, for instance, this is k, so it's really a wage of uh, copies of p1 modulo p1 minus uh, y. 
But the, if you remove a rational point in P1 here, uh, P1 minus x, x is rational, this is isomorphic to A1. So when you do this quotient here, this is A1, in our theory it is contractible. So this is a homotopy occurrence. It's a basic example of homotopy occurrence. Uh, and now, so here you have the, the wage, P1 over K map to this, you have F, P1 over K, and uh, map to P1 over K modulo A1, which is an equivalence factor as here. And the only uh, rest of the proof is to check uh, this is the wage. So morphism from P1 to this here, so it's a, it's a co-group, uh, it's, it's a suspension, as I mentioned at the beginning. So in fact, this morphism is the sum of all the morphism here. So this is the wage over I of the canonical morphism from P1 over K to this one. Kappa of Y modulo uh, A1 over Kappa of Y. And this is called a transfer from L from Kappa of Y to K here. So this is the homological version of what I used here. Okay? The uh, unit is also encoded here, uh, in this uh, identification here. And this is the projection. So this is the dual of this formula. So you can check that this is exactly the formula. This is the degree of f at the point x, which shows, of course, that it is independent, because it's uh, fixed by f. Okay? Uh, so what is uh, harder, of course, is to check, for instance, it's uh, homotopy invariant. So how many minutes does it, does it remain? Hmm? Two minutes, okay. Uh, so, well, it will, it will do. Uh, so fact, so fact, uh, the homotopy, the pointed homotopy, uh, let me, pointed homotopy classes of P1 of K. So really the naive uh, A1 homotopy classes of Russian fraction, you know, exactly defined in this way, uh, have been uh, computed by Kazanov by hands. So you take Russian fraction and you look at all the possible A1 homotopies and uh, it's uh, proven that this embed into what is called the GW tilde of K. So it means there is a one more invariant and GW tilde, it's a fiber product of the Grotonic vitring. Uh, so if you have a quadratic form of a general uh, field K, you have the rank and the discriminant here. When you take a basis uh, of your uh, quadratic form here, you have a basis, so the, the, binar, the binar form is a diagonal. You take the, data, uh, the discriminant, the product. It's independent up to the square by change of basis here. So it's a unit modulo the square. But in that case here, you have the lifting. So somehow this is the ring of isomorphic classes, the grotonic between of isomorphic classes of uh, symmetric bilinear forms with a lift of the discriminant as a unit by automorphism which uh, map the basis of this type to uh, and which reserves the determinant here. So he proved that this is a subset here. Uh, it's efficient it's, uh, somehow because here you, you get only a positive uh, dimension here uh, that this is uh, inside. So by hands, but this is a set of pointed classes. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the homotopy classes, it's a bit more tricky. I won't have time to explain this. Uh, this is uh, the quotient of this set, so, or this one if you want, if you want to extend, by the action of the T1, of T1 here. So what I prove is that to extend this, uh, because here you see uh, uh, what is the problem is in rational fraction, it gives you only a form of uh, positive dimension. So you have to add morphism uh, you don't have inverse here. It's, a, it's supposed to be a co-group, but you have, you have no inverse here. So you have to formalize uh, to uh, add the inverse. So this is the aim of A1 on the P theory. Uh, it's closed this, and in fact, so 
theorem uh, from myself. So uh, in the homotopy category, the pointed homotopy classes from P1 to P1, uh, so in the uh, homotopy, A1, homotopy category, is equal to GW. So it completes exactly. But it's less elementary, of course. The action of the phi one is non-trivial. In fact, this is a, a shift which is non-abelian. It's a central extension, so I have no time to explain this, but you will see probably this uh, uh, the pi one here. You have an epimorphism to GM coming from the map to P infinity, and here you have a funny object. So you have a chemical section, and this is the uh, this extension is defined by imposing that. So you have a section which is not a morphism of groups, and here is the difference: the section of a two symbol minus the uh, section of the product of the symbol. It gives you this, the universal symbol. And the action is tricky, so it's not so easy to describe the the set of free homotopy classes. But now uh, the stable theorem is that for any n, and I will finish. If you look at morphisms, so with a bracket. So there is no difference when you are high enough between pointed and unpointed and P1 smash N to P1 smash N, which is a, a sphere of high dimension, but it's not a smooth scheme. It's a homotopy construction uh, for N greater or equal to 2 is to the degree isomorphic to the rotten V train. And this gives you the stabilization and the computation of the so-called stable uh, pi zero of uh, the sphere spectrum in the motivic setting. Thank you very much.